This is uh, quintessentially British. We have tea and biscuits and we are talking PDF. Yes, it's the 30th anniversary of the release of PDF. I knew it was going to be a success of sorts, but I did not foresee how widely it is now taken up. But I must add to that, I also underestimated how long it would take people to twig what it was for. So that was an extra source of tension, you know. It's all very well, David, you've been telling us to go with PDF. It's the future. Well, the future's taking an awful long time coming. I'm pleased I was right because I am not a futurologist. I generally shy away from making definitive statements about what will catch on and what won't. But this one I was convinced about because um, I knew it was the future, but I just didn't quite get right the gap that there was. Uh, between it being released and it being adopted, and largely because even people in the trade didn't fully understand what it was doing and the leverage and extra flexibility it would give them in what they did. I think I've talked elsewhere on PDF, what is it for? Even people in the trade could sort of, well, I do everything with linotype, what's wrong with that? And I would say, well, suppose you could make your pages of stuff even better if they could insert material prepared on kit that wasn't from your favourite setter, but was adhering to this new standard called PDF. And in certain, with certain rules, you could insert bits of PDF here, there and everywhere. And they said, what, by subverting all? I said, not necessarily by subverting all the software you're using, but just by saying, I can do an insert here using this add-on to the plugin, and it's completely self-contained, but I can put bits and pieces here, there and everywhere. It gave potentially massive new flexibility. I think what I didn't realize at the time was that because in the end PDF was a success, it really was instrumental in changing my career direction. Uh, I had, I and my merry gang of colleagues got into this because we were computer scientists. We were not, at least I was not, thinking at the time of wouldn't it be nice to do those really smart, sharp documents that Bell Labs can do and that even when you photograph them and put them through a photocopier from the release material that's about this thick when it comes to the post. Even if you photocopied it again, it still looked good and it looked better than anything we'd got. Would it ever be a situation where quality of that potential became available to mere, how shall we say, enthusiasts from the wrong side of the Atlantic? PDF came out in 93. That's correct. But is that... You got involved a bit earlier, didn't you? Yes, I did. Um, even before I knew about PDF, just as part of reading the Unix documentation, because we'd bought Unix about three or four years before, even got a little PDP 1134 to get ourselves started. We were just a computer science group within a bigger maths grouping. It was only a little machine, but it was ours, and it was wonderful, and we could play with it. So it became a strange feeling to be the proud owner of some machinery, which basically only made sense at that money and uh, with that degree of expenditure, due to the fact that in an incredible display of uh, bounty to us all, good old Bell Labs and the highly talented people there invented Unix as an operating system and then gave it away because they couldn't be seen to be making money and using these obscene quantities of income from this stream of stuff they shouldn't be doing anyway, and then using it to try and put us out of business by undercutting us on everything we did. It wasn't true, but you could see how corporate sensitivities were aroused by companies that were under restraint and Bell Labs was told, you will not convert yourself into a computer company. You will stay hands-off, you will help universities. If you help other companies 
boy, we're going to draw up such a tight thing because we have got the entire US government on our necks if we are seeing as breaking the antitrust rules. So it's all worked out extremely well for higher education establishments. I could see from <coughs> the documentation that came with the Unix that the very lowest level of output device they had was essentially what would be given from a daisy wheel printer. Laser printers were in the process of being invented by Hewlett Packard and by Xerox Park and others, but they were not widely available yet. So if you wanted a slightly lower quality but good version, you had to change technologies completely. Because by this stage, your genuine typesetter end of things was beginning the path towards crawling towards laser printers at 6 or 1200 dpi. But that was about the best you could get. And the problem was that if you went for these other technologies, which were basically like teletypes, typewriter fonts and so on, then you ended up with the, your output looking fairly neat, but not the same as it would have looked if only I could have afforded to send it off to a proper typesetter like an Autologic Apps 5 or a Linotronic 202. And this machine, UK design, is called the Linotronic 202. This was the one step... So if you want a few anecdotes there about how I changed my f uh, field, simply because of an unlooked-for gift of a proper typesetter that really could do 972 dots per inch and you didn't mind the smell of Bromo developer and fixer. There you go. Because I didn't have to wait that long. I could see coming off the laser print, Mac laser printer in the early 80s. Here it was on plain paper, no chemical processing. Took about a minute to image each page, but this was clearly the future. It would soon speed up. The chemicals will be like a memory from yesterday. I remember growing up and people talking about this mythical paperless office, right? It was all about, oh, we won't be printing things out. Everything will be on the screens. And of course, we kind of, we're a lot closer to that these days, aren't we? But was well, that in thought when things like PDF and PostScript were coming out? Oh, there was a lot of debate about why don't we leave it all electronic and just post the... Um, script of the paper in front. Oh, they're all in the future, David, have a little terminal on their desk in the exam room. And I thought, oh, no, they won't. But this was the idea. It'll all be electronic. Paper will be so like yesterday, people will be baffled by what it was. No, I didn't see this. I, th I thought it would be an incredible adjunct to have both electronic and paper kept alongside each other. And I think this is true even now, as you see in my legacy box here, I do try to keep hard copy archive versions of things that are really important, as well as locking the actual document and the software somewhere safe in the file system of my Linux machine, which is over in that direction. Your typesetting exams, you've changed your field and you're yeah. now working in document engineering. Is that fair? That's right. How do you get from there to kind of PDF and, and beyond? Well, PDF was the common factor between the two. I mean, the more, if you like, important test was whether that we could produce and distribute a, a serious journal, just a little demonstration piece, and it worked. But at the same time, as a as a, what's the word, <clears throat> unlooked for side effect, we had also got something which was, my point of view, was perfectly good, low quality, lower quality, but for exam papers, you were killing two birds with one stone. And I thought, well, you know, this is absolutely great. It's just what we need for all of the unwashed who can't tell the difference. We'll get a blurry but okay thing off the Macintosh laser printer 
everything else, if people still cared and could still tell the difference, could be sent to a bromide typesetter. But I did forecast that increasingly people wouldn't be bothered and I could see coming up on the rails but never quite, quite quick enough for me to head off trouble at the pass was improvement in laser printer quality. I mean, you're talking now about 3,000 or 2,000 dots per inch, that sort of thing, minimum. But in those days, it was, wow, it's now possible to get a 600 DPI laser printer. You know, if people say, well, how did you know you were on the right track, Dave, and this time it will go your way? Well, I thought, well, just out of the blue, because they'd heard about what I was doing on the grapevine, Lord knows how Adobe UK found out what we were doing. But there again, by that time, we'd taken on John Wiley's for the actual experiment. And it was not beyond, you know, not beyond possible that some backlink somewhere had joined the two together because I did not solicit the letter from John Warnock and Chuck Geschke. They sent it to me out of the blue. You know, if you're not too busy on this particular day, <laughs> would you just like to come down? And I said, well, I'd like to come down, but I'll bring the um, John Wiley UK technical director, Mark Bide. I'll bring him down with me because I know that he will want to hear what your plans are. One has to remember that on the other side of the fence, there were technologies being developed alongside these that were relevant but needed bridging points to show people where you could jump paradigm as it were because the big problem was there was the world of appearance and super duper pdf and there was the world of structure even if it's only para or p from xml html everybody wanted superb quality of appearance to be diggable outable of all this stuff. They also wanted full capability to use the tags as kind of semantic markup. What is the meaning of this? And if you're not careful, you end up with a single source file with about 27 different interpretations, whether it's purely structure, partly structure, trying to second guess what PDF's going to do, whatever. The two sides are still not reconciled. Not surprising, because there is a big semantic gap between the two. It's all very well to structure it, but that magic thing about how does that known tree structure translate into something visually meaningful and helpful is another big problem in its own right. Everybody, your architect, your whoever, whoever, doesn't matter how technical this stuff is, if it's anything graphic -y, vectors, shadowed photographs, whatever, 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 this technology is powerful enough to do it. And all it requires is the people who have adopted this technology not to try and corner the market and make it their own because they won't succeed. The whole reason for Adobe being prepared to give up some control to ISO was that in a sense, they could moderate and police the way it developed. And it wouldn't just be seen as an Adobe benefit match. And I think they got that right because what they got was the status of being the undoubted experts behind PostScript and PDF. And uh, my colleague Matthew, as I say, is on the ISO committee in Geneva for quite a few years and uh, was regularly sent back to the USA um, saying, will you ask the designer of PostScript what on earth he was thinking about? And, and be able to come back and say, that is not a feature, it's a bug. <laughs> and in the course of testing out all our worst cases to try and keep you ISO happy, we will no doubt run through lots, lots more of these. So it's, it's sort of for robustness. Now what's happened is the app has gone in, cropped the image down to a much smaller one, which takes up less space in memory. These are like kind of engineering-y type things. This one is getting, creating, removing, providing, criticizing. So like for some reason, these types of words.